This video is sponsored by Celiche. So in part one of this build, we covered various joinery methods to make this white oak vanity, part furniture and part cabinet, and a bit modular so it could be transported. Now we can turn our attention to doors and hinges, drawers and soft close undermount slides, and then finish, and then the final install. Of course, not everything went to plan. Okay. Oh my. All right, so here's the material I'm going to use for the drawer fronts. Because these two are so similar and they're from the same board, I think we can get them looking almost as if it's from one piece all the way down. I'm gonna make these a little bit oversized. They need to be about 15. I'm gonna make them about 18. That way we have a little wiggle room. And in case anything went a little askew on me, I had a little extra material, so I planned out for a few extra drawer fronts. That way I would have plenty of flexibility on choosing grain and color. Let's cut these, resaw them to rough thickness, stack and sticker, and let them acclimate. And because these pieces were so wide, the easiest way to break these down to rough length was to use the track saw. And then over to the table saw to rip them to rough width, and to the band saw to resaw them. Now the quarter inch or a little bit over piece that is coming off the side, that can be used later for our door panels. And I'm just gonna stack and sticker all these and let them, uh, you know, become accustomed to their environment. Now with the other big chunk cut off, so this eight quarter, I'll be using this for the door styles and the other door panels. So I'm labeling them as such, and then back to the bandsaw to resaw them. Now I'm cutting these extra thick because they're actually going to be glued to an MDF core and then used on the door panels. Now, unfortunately, when you expose all that surface area to fresh air and moisture, they want to cup. So if you spritz just a little water on the concave side, you can see it will start to absorb moisture there and flatten out. You can see on the left was before and on the right was after. What do you think, Jer? Alrighty then. Now there are multiple ways to plane down thin stock. The first method is to take a thick substrate and use double-sided tape to adhere it, and that works nicely. Use a putty knife to kind of wedge it off. The other method is to use tape on both substrates and some CA glue and just stick that down. Now the reason I do this is because the thinner the stock, the more likely it is to turn into mulch through your planer. And especially with my planer, anything thinner than a quarter of an inch gets real dicey even with an auxiliary sled underneath. Now the other option is to just take it over to someone's house who has a drum sander, like my buddy Pete. And then back at my drum sanderless shop, it was time to cut down some MDF panels for our veneer glue ups of these door panels. So once I cut those to rough size, I cut the panels to rough size. And then it was time for a little truffle shuffle, moving things around, getting my panel set, checking the wood grain, flipping it over, under, getting everything organized so they are going to look their best inside and outside of the door. Now to glue up these white oak and MDF little sandwiches, I'm going to be using Gorilla Polyurethane Glue. Now a lot of people have some misconceptions about this product because it foams up quite a bit, but if you put down a nice, even, thin layer using a foam roller, you get perfect results and a rock solid panel. So I put the glue on one side, applied my white oak, flipped it over and did the same on the other side. Now this Gorilla Glue actually needs a little spritz of water to kind of activate and cure. So I'm just using my mister and spraying the other side of the panel before making my sandwich, using a little green tape to make sure that one side kind of stays aligned and the panels don't shift all over the place in the bag. Then I could make a bigger sandwich of these smaller sandwiches using my melamine panels, which I cut some grooves in the top to allow the air to escape once this thing is in the bag and the air compressor is hooked up. So once it was in the bag, it was just all about sealing the end and then hooking up my nozzle, turning on the air and watching the magic happen. <laughs> So I have all my rails and styles marked out before cutting. As you can see, I made some marks just so I know that this one goes next to this one because I want the grain to match from door to door when possible. And for the ones I didn't have ripped to rough width, I'll do that on the bandsaw, make one pass with these guys, and then these I'll rip in half and then in half again. And then I'll run everything through the thickness planer to make sure I have an even consistent width across all pieces. 
Then it was the truffle shuffle shell game again, moving around all my pieces to find the perfect set of styles for each door, color consistency, and grain. All right, so first we want to take dimensions of our rough opening here, which is really our finished opening. So we got 17. This should be 17 as well. It is 23 and three quarter, 23 and three quarter. Now we'll do a quick sketch and show you how we're going to size all these parts before we get out the cope and stick bit and cut the cope and stick. Okay, so here's a little schematic. Our width is 23 and three quarter. Our height is 17. So since we have two doors in here, they are gonna be half of this distance, which when you do the math, comes out to 11 and 7 eighths. So to get the length of our rails, we also need to subtract the width of our styles. And since all of our rails and styles are two and a quarter inches right now, we're gonna subtract two of those, which is four and a half. So that gives us seven and three eighths. So that is the length of our rail, right? Nope. A lot of people make this mistake when they're using a cope and stick bit set like this. As you can see here on part B, the tongue will marry with the groove that we cut in these styles. So you also need to account for the length of that tongue, which in this bit set is three eighths of an inch. So we have three eighths of an inch tongue on this side of the rail and three eighths on this side. So to this seven and three eighths, we need to add three quarter. And that gives us eight and one eighth inch rails. So we need one, two, three, four for these two doors and then four more for the other side. So we'll need a total of eight of those. And the styles, we're gonna cut right to 17. I'm cutting these to the exact dimensions of the opening. And then once they're all glued up, we'll trim them and size them exactly to fit perfectly with a 3 32nd reveal or gap all the way around. Right, the top of this blade is just hanging over the top edge and here it just hanging over the bottom edge. So that's about as centered as, as I can get it by eye. And it's super important that these cuts be perfectly square off your saw because if they're at an angle, then your cope is gonna be at an angle and your doors will not go together square. So to check that I'm centered, just grab the setup block and I'm just shy of that edge there and just shy of them, just catching a nail there. Now we can set up the stick bit. So with a quick test piece, I could make a pass and then use my coat piece and check the fit. And that looks pretty good. So over at my cross cut sled, set up a stop block to cut all my rails to the right length. And then I could go back to the router table and cut all the copes in both sides. One thing to pay extreme attention to is when you're doing both sides of a cope, you wanna make sure you don't flip the piece over. You want the same side up. And once all my copes were cut in my rails, I could bring those over to the other router table, cut all the grooves or sticks in those as well as all of the styles. Then over at the table saw, I'm gonna cut all those styles to the exact same length using another stop block. Okay, now that I have all of my doors cut with the styles and the rails roughly fitted together, I can now start sizing my panels. Now, because the groove all the way around goes 3 eighths of an inch, I measured the width of the opening and the length of an opening and then added three eighths and three eighths. And that gave me a panel of eight and an eighth by 13 and a quarter. Now that's a panel that's going to fit that perfectly. We wanna cut that back a little bit to allow for expansion and contraction sideways. But just to give us an idea, this is the rough size of the panel. So the panel is going to be rabbited in so it fits in this groove and then also overhang so it's flush with the inside of the door. That gives a much beefier panel and makes the door a little more heavy duty. So I'm just gonna take a measurement from the outside to the outside of that groove, and there you go, 17, 30 seconds. So that's what I need to get my panel down to before we size it and cut the rabbits. 
And once my veneered panels were out of the bag, I can take them over to the joiner, get a nice flat face since these things weren't perfectly flat, and run them back through the thickness planer to get a nice consistent thickness of 17 30 seconds. And once I had the right thickness, the next logical step was to cut them to size. So ripped them to width and then ripped them to length using the crosscut sled. To cut the rabbits, I set up an auxiliary fence and my dado stack and I just make a pass on all four sides and then I have a nice rabbited panel. I'm using about 3 30 seconds gap all the way around. That will give the panel kind of room to move left and right. But since it's nice and flush with the back of the rails and styles, it also just adds a nice detail, nice and clean. And then here are all four doors assembled and ready for pre-finish of the panels. I wanna pre-finish these in case there's any wood movement down the road. You don't wanna see raw wood if this panel shrinks. So pre-finishing it ahead of time will eliminate that possibility. And then it was time for the glue up. Just putting a little glue on the copes and on the grooves there. So that little bit of glue in the middle will anchor that panel in the middle and allow the expansion and contraction to happen outward. I'm trying to minimize squeeze out of glue in those corners at all costs. So I actually set the glue line back a little bit. I do not want to have to use water or scrape glue out of those corners later on. It becomes very difficult to clean up. Then I just use a putty knife to kind of manipulate my panel around and get it centered uh, between my rails and styles. Clean up any glue squeeze out there. And then using diagonal measurements, I check for square. Elbow cam there. And those look pretty good. Okay, so while the doors are in the clamps, let's talk about drawers. We're going to be using Celiche F70 heavy duty smooth slides on these. These are beautiful slides with a rack and pinion action on the bottom. Obviously soft close, super smooth, super quiet. Now you don't necessarily need heavy duty for small drawers like this, but I like to go a little overboard sometimes. So I mapped out a big bottom drawer where the top will be in the same plane as the bottom of the rail on each side here. So once the bottom drawer was decided, then I took the remaining space and divided it into thirds. And I'm gonna be using 3 30 second spacing in between each. So I had to subtract that distance. And then that gave me the width of each drawer front so they were all equal. Now in deciding on what size the drawer boxes should be, I had to do a little math because from the bottom of the slide, to the underside or the bottom of the drawer box is about an inch and an eighth. So once I map that out on the side of the cabinet, then I could figure out the height of my drawer based on where the next drawer front started. And in this case, these came out to four and a quarter. Now I outsource all my drawers, mostly. And why do I do that? Well, I use five eighths birch or maple for the sides. Some people use half inch, which is fine, but either way, I can't buy five eighths inch thick material around here. So I would have to buy three quarter and mill it down. So you're wasting material and you're wasting labor to mill it down to five eighths. Then you have to cut all your pieces to size, cut all the dovetail joints, glue it all up, sand it, finish it, sand it, finish it. And instead I ordered four drawers, three smaller ones and one big one for less than $300. So it just makes sense to have someone else do these because they have dialed in the process and this is all they do. Now, since these are 18 inch slides, the drawer depth is 18 inches. Now to figure out the width that's going to go in here, that's pretty easy. It's all right here in the catalog. So here's a diagram of our drawer. This is your case right here. Here's your drawer box, side and a side, and then a cross section of the drawer slides and then mounted to the inside of the cabinet. Here's your drawer bottom, which is this light piece going across. So all the specs are right down here. For a drawer side thickness of 5 eighths, which is what we're using, all we need to do is subtract from the inside cabinet width 3 eighths of an inch. Now our inside cabinet width was 15 inches. So 14 and 5 eighths, pretty simple math. If you're in metric, just as simple. So the next step here is to get our slides mounted and then our, get our drawer boxes in and then start sizing and fitting our drawer fronts. But then based on my measurements, which I have here, I'm going to cut some spacers to set the slides on and screw in to make sure that they are perfectly parallel and even on both sides. So this 332nd space right here represents my reveals 
and then I came up a half an inch and drew a line. Now, although the spec sheet says a 10 millimeter setback for that first hole, I highly recommend using the slotted opening. That way you can adjust the slide in and out. Although the locking devices have this adjustment to come in and out, it comes from the factory maxed out inward. So you're only able to move the drawer outward. And since my face frame is 13 16 they were sitting a little bit proud. So I re-drilled my holes into the slotted and then I can adjust my drawer in and out, tighten that down and then add a few more screws to secure everything. And then it was production work. I just clamped on my spacers, attached the slide to one side, moved the spacer over, did the same thing, cut the spacers down, mounted that slide and just made my way all the way to the bottom until all four sets of slides were installed. Okay, these are the standard locking clips that will lock the drawer into the drawer slide. You can see here on the underside of the drawer, there's a half inch lip all the way around that is standard for installation of these locking devices. You can also see there are several mounting holes. There's these here, which allow you to drill straight down and into the drawer bottom. Unfortunately, it is recommended to use number six, five eighth screws. And our drawer bottom is only half an inch, so those screws would go right through. So the other option, the recommended option, are these two, which will drive into the drawer front, which is what we will use. Now the drawer adjustments on these, this knob right here can rotate back and forth. It'll give you depth adjustment front to back. This knob will give you lateral adjustment side to side. You always wanna pre-drill these, especially in hardwood. This is maple, or you will crack the wood. And once I had all my locking devices installed, I could then mount all the drawers, make sure the action was nice and smooth and everything fit well and they were even. We could check with Jerry and Lola and see what they think. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Moving on then. Now back to the doors. They were all out of the clamp, so I'm running a nice cut along the bottom just to square everything up. Then I could place them in the opening and we could start the inset fitting process. It left me with a 16th of an inch total gap from top to bottom. So I put in these 30 second spacers and since I want three 30 seconds gap, top, bottom, left and right, I'm now gonna add a 16th to that. So that gives me three 30 seconds and just draw a line there and here. And up here, I'm gonna take the three 30 second spacer and I'm gonna line it up with the top or the bottom of the rail, make a line, and the same thing over here. That ensures it's square top and bottom with my opening. Now both of these doors are pushed out perfectly to the ends here. And in the middle, I have 1 16th gap. But that needs to be 3 32nd, this needs to be 3 32nd, and this needs to be 3 32nd. But before we mark the edges out, Let's get both of these marked. I'll grab this 30 second spacer and put it under here. Grab my 16. And then the 3 30 seconds up top. So now we can head to the table saw on the crosscut sled and make those cuts. And then we'll bring these back and mark for our verticals. So I transferred my cut line around and down the front along the long edge. That way I can line up my pencil line with my zero clearance insert there and my back pencil line with the back fence and the zero clearance insert. Now when I line up the back one and the front, it's off a little bit. It's not perfectly square. So that means the opening is not perfectly square. It happens all the time. So what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna rotate this just a hair until I get those lines where I want them. Now, my piece is tight back here, but there's a little gap here. So I'm just gonna take a piece of paper and put it right in there. And then make the cut. I put these blocks using just double-sided tape on here just so that the doors don't fall in. I have 3 30 seconds spacers that I made. Put those there, drop this first one in, and then these should fit perfectly just snug at the top. There we go. 
And if you ever wonder why it costs more for inset doors, this is why. So now I'm gonna take my 330 seconds and the same on the opposite side. A little blurrier though. A few passes on the joiner and it brings me right down to my layout lines. Now that all my spacers are in, top and bottom, left and right, you can probably see on camera, there's a little bit of a gap difference here on top versus the bottom, which just means the opening is a hair out of square. No problem at all. I'm just gonna put some tape on here up and down, then just take a square and draw a straight line down, giving me a 3 30 seconds gap between each door Ah, what are you doing? <laughs> All right, so even though this one was slightly tapered. Oh, Lola, Lola. Oh my goodness, okay. Okay. Oh my. All right, even though those were tapered, I did them on the jointer. But there we go. Now we have 330 seconds all the way around. And then I'll do the same thing on the other doors. All right, before we do any layout of where we want our hinges, be sure and mark where your hinges go on each door. Because it's very easy once you flip these things over to accidentally drill in the wrong location. And the distance from the end on these isn't super critical. It usually ranges to the center, somewhere between three, three and a half. In this case, I want this line right here to be in line with that little groove. Sometimes you'll see when you open cabinets is that the top of this hinge flange is right in line with this. But in this case, that will put these really close together and it just looks odd. So moving it up and spreading it out a little bit, I think looks a little bit better. So I did a little math here and to get these hinges right in line with that groove like that, I need to come down. Two and 11 sixteenths will be my center point for this. So I've set my little square to two and 11 sixteenths. Then I'm just gonna carry that all the way through. Now as with most cup hinges like this, the distance center to center on the mounting holes for these flanges or screw holes, if you're using screw mounted ones, is 45 millimeters or one and 13 sixteenths. Now, typically I would use this Craig jig for not only drilling out the 35 millimeter hole, but then it also gives me perfect position for these outer two holes. But this thing can be a little bit sloppy and I really want these to be perfect. So I'm gonna do the 35 millimeter hole on the drill press, but this jig gives me perfect placement for these outer two holes. So with my reveal set at four millimeters, I can butt this up to the side of the door and drill a couple pilot holes that I need for these. So I'm just gonna butt this up against and you can see there's a center line on this jig that I will line up with my line. And then on the drill press, I can make an eight millimeter hole to house these expanding dowels. And with my drill press depth set, I could just drill all those eight millimeter holes in all four doors. So 16 holes in total. Okay, I have my 35 millimeter bit chucked up in the drill press. And if you recall, we needed a four millimeter offset from the edge of the door. So I have a four millimeter spacer block here. I'm just gonna bring my drill bit down and then move my fence until that spacer hits the drill bit. And then drill all eight of those holes. You can see the little plastic depth checker over there. That works well to set up the depth stop on a scrap piece. So before I start drilling any holes for mounting plates on the inside of the cabinet, I made this little mock up here. So you can see this line all the way down here. That indicates our reveal or our setback of our doors, which is 3 eighths of an inch. While I had the drill press set up over there, I took a two and a quarter inch style drilled out my holes. So then I just took our hinge plates, mounted them in our hinges and held this up so the outside of our door was in line with our reveal line and then just marked a couple of holes. Now that can become cumbersome doing this on every door. So I made this little jig out of plexiglass. It is perfectly square to this. These holes are 32 millimeters apart. So just to show you that this, how this works, and mount these hinges on here. 
and then that closes nicely. You can see I still have a nice reveal. And then when I open it, it is very close to hitting the side, but it doesn't. And then the soft close. Now the way I fabricated this jig was I cut the length of my square stop so that it lines up perfectly with the line that I carried around at the bottom of the rail. And on the bottom, it will be the top of the rail. So with the top of this lined up with that, that puts my mounting holes in the correct position based on where the hinge is on the door as well as taking into account my 330 second reveal. So it just takes a little math to get this figured out, but once you do, now I can drill my holes here, flip it around on the other side. So like I said, it takes a little longer to make this jig, but you saw how fast and accurate it was. And they also make these titanium screws, which pair nicely with the titanium mounting plates. Now these are posi drive screws, so there's a special Screwdriver this is magnetic. Then I could just pop in my hinges, snap them down. Those expand the dowels in the holes for a nice tight fit without screws. And then mount the doors and see how the spacing looks. So we need a little bit of adjustment up and down, side to side, but for all intents and purposes, those are good to go. The jig works. And all these fine tune adjustments will be made once everything is in place. But, so this screw back here will move this hinge in and out. I was using this screw here, which brings the hinge like this. Now we need to move this up and down. And that's this little screw right in here. See how the plate goes up and down? So we need to go up just a little, do it evenly in both. And I'm just gonna do that until my 330 second spacer is tight at the top. Like that. Now we can check. Oh yeah. You can see, nice even line all the way across there. We know our outer edges are 330 seconds. We checked those already. So up and down, side to side, we're good. Now we're all set. I'll do the other two the same way. Now the doors on the right side took a little fiddling and adjusting as well. But once that was all done, I had a nice even gap all the way around and they closed together nicely. Now I could turn my attention to the drawer fronts. These have been stacked and stickered for a while. So I am milling them down to their final thickness of 13 16 of an inch. Then I could take them over to the table saw on the crosscut sled and get them to rough width so they fit in the opening and then we could start sizing them just like we did the doors. And then I could just stack them in place with a 3 32nd spacer in between and then pretty much the same process as the doors. I'm just using a 3 32nd inch spacer going down the left side marking all my lefts and then going down the right side and making all those marks as well and then over to the table saw and trimming them all to my layout lines. Now, unfortunately, this opening was a little bit out of square as well. So you can see I got a little paper shim there in the front, which just angles my piece just enough. So I get a bit of a tapered cut. So I do that to all four drawer fronts, and then we can go back and see how they fit. Fortunately, those all fit nicely. And then, well, construction was over and there was only one thing left to do. That's right, all that hard work now has to be reversed as I disassemble this entire thing to get it all sanded and prep for finish and do some sub-assembly glue ups. First up, I'm going to glue the center legs into that intermediate panel. This is where those pocket screws come in nice and handy. These will never be seen, but they act as perfect clamps while the glue dries. Now I had pre-finished all the slats for the two shelves on the left and right. Now I could get these things filled with dominoes and then glued up to the back rail and the front rail. So as you can see, I also taped off everywhere where I'm going to need glue adhesion because glue does not like to stick to an oil wax finish. Now I'm not gonna bore you with all the sanding on this, but everything was sanded up to 150. I eased all the edges by hand with a router and then with sandpaper. And then finally, I was able to apply the Rubio Monocoat Castle Brown. As you can see, I also taped off the ends of these rails because those are going to need some glue when they meet the cabinet legs and also the back, which is going to meet the cabinet box. 
So it just takes a little pre-planning to know where your glue is going to be and make sure you don't put finish there. Then I could move on to the doors and everything else, which again, I am not going to bore you with that process. As you can see, Jerry is quite bored himself. Now to drill the recessed holes for the leveling feet, I first did try an inch and a half Forstner bit, a fresh brand new Forstner bit. And because of that end grain white oak, the bit was binding, walking, and stalling the drill. A number of drills. I tried many different ones. So I turned to this. I made myself a little template with some plywood and then just used a pattern bit and kind of made my way down different depths until I got to the depth I needed. And then I could insert this little kind of T-nut threaded thing that the insert would go into. And there you have it. Screws down in, it can go flush. Now it's time to repair this. Poor Lola. Mm -hmm. I first put some tape down so no glue would leak onto my panel. And then I needed a three inch circle, but I didn't have one. So I used my medallion maker template and a pattern bit and just cut basically a little quarter moon out of there. And then I needed to make a template the opposite of that circle. So an actual three inch circle. So I did that on my little router jig here. And then using that pattern bit again, I templated out a piece of white oak and cut this little sliver off on the table saw using some old brown glue in here because I didn't want this to interfere with the finish. That's the great thing about this hide glue. And then taped off everything so nothing would stick. Used a couple of clamps and turned them into spreaders so I could get pressure across the width here between the two styles. And then when that was all dry, I just popped them off, sanded the surface flush first, and then got in on that little edge by hand. And here's the fix. There's definitely a line there, but not too bad. I just had no material to remake this entire door. And plus with all the grain match that we had worked through to get it to match the door next to it. And with the panel and the lamination and all that, it was just better to make the fix. And then it was time. Total boat, baby. That's right, little KJ. I'm using some total boat fixo here. This gives us a little more open time. And that there's my buddy Pete from Petrie's Workshop helping me with this glue up, which was huge. I really needed an extra set of hands here and Jerry's little paws just weren't gonna cut it. So Pete helped me glue everything up, move everything around and just not only made it easier, but made it faster and damage free. So then it was just a matter of reassembling the way we had disassembled. So we're gluing on these rails here and then once the glue is applied, I can just turn that Allen key. That acts as my clamp. And I'm going to use those same Clamex connectors by Lamello to attach these end panels. Now we had discussed before that these end panels will never be seen, but I didn't want to just glue and screw them from the inside. So using the Lamello just makes it nice and easy to pop that on, turn that Allen key. And I did put a couple down below as well to secure it. Now I needed to make some custom door stops. I totally forgot about that way back. So I took some white oak and I'm cutting a rabbit in here, which will allow for the thickness of the door bumper. So once that was cut, then I could rip this to width, made a couple cuts at 45 on the miter saw, and then over to the table saw with the sled to clean those up. And that's what it looks like. Now let's go pre-drill some countersunk holes. And we'll accomplish this at the drill press. And then we can head back over to the bench and pre-finish these. Now, again, I'm not applying finish where I need to apply glue. And then I could apply said glue on the inside. You can see I sanded away a little finish there just to get me enough grip. Now, two screws would probably be enough to hold this. The glue is a bit of belt and suspenders, but that's the kind of guy I am. I love my suspenders. And here's what it looks like from the outside. And here are bumpers, these little teeny morsels. Now you can buy ones that screw on or actually drill into the door itself in case they want to fall off, but I've never had a problem with these. And we also had to plug those holes on the back two legs where we had screwed the cabinet into the leg. Now again, these will never be seen, but I wanted to, you know, cover those holes. So I took some pre-finished white oak and drilled out a bunch of plugs and then cut them and mixed and matched them until they looked decent. They're not perfect, but decent. And here's a little top to bottom scan, just so you can see. And then it was more glue up. Now the top rail on that middle section, and then we'll move to the bottom rail as well. Little Clamex, turns that cam clamp. No clamps needed, no nails. Love it. 
Then we can get to work on attaching our drawer fronts. Now at this point, I did not have the hardware. That wasn't gonna be available until I got to the job site. So quick tip when installing these drawer fronts. Typically, you put your spacers in, you put your drawer front on, you clamp it, you pull it out, you put your screws in, and then you pull your spacers out and the whole drawer drops. That's because the weight of the drawer front and the weight of the clamp are all pulling down on the drawer, but you don't notice it. So what I do is I put some counterbalance in there, a couple drills, maybe Jerry. That way it'll simulate the weight of the drawer front. That way when I pull those out, pull the clamp off, pull the spacers out, the drawer doesn't drop. Now another method for attaching these fronts is to drill an oversized hole on each side. And then using one of these super head washers, that as you can see only has threads near the bottom half or bottom third. So these fit in this hole. There's a little wiggle room left and right and up and down. So when you mount the drawer front with these screws, you tighten these down. And then if you need to make any adjustments left or right, you can loosen these and then tighten them back down and then secure with your final screws. Now, yes, there are adjustments in the locking devices of the drawer slides, but sometimes I like to get this perfect and use those only as a last resort. So then I could just continue my way up. I'll do the second drawer from the bottom first, get that attached and so on and so forth. Two more. And then it was install day. Now it was a bit of a feat getting these two large pieces up the stairs, around the corner, down the hall, down the other hall and in through the doorway into the bathroom, but we got them in and back to the total belt thick. So just applying this everywhere on those dominoes and the Clamex connectors. And here you can see hopefully the entire thought process of my assembly plan. So with a little glue and a clamp, this thing comes together. I turn those Clamex cams and this thing is together one piece. And once the cabinet was centered left to right on the wall and level and plumb, I could attach it through these back rails into the wall. Now to cover up those little access holes for the Allen keys of the Clamex, Lamello makes these little cover caps. They come in various colors, and then I can just pop them in here. It's a nice little touch just to get those covered. And then I could install all the hinges back in. I labeled them all because of all my pre-adjustments back at the shop. Ceviche also makes these little hinge cap covers to cover those screws up. Then I could get the drawers in, get those adjusted, and install the hardware. So I'm using this True Position Tools hardware jig, which it is expensive, $250 or something, but man, does it make this fast and easy. I think it took me longer to get all the doors and drawers installed than it did to put the hardware on. And it's always a bit of a dramatic reveal when you haven't seen the hardware or had it in hand before you install it on site on the finished piece. And I gotta say, I love it. Well, that's a wrap on this one. Well, except for the countertop and the electrical and fixtures and mirrors and all that, but that's someone else's job. Special thanks to Ceviche for providing all the undermount drawer slides and the soft close hinges for this project. I'll have links to all the products used in the description below. And if you missed part one of this vanity build, where we went through all this insane joinery with the Festool Domino and the Lamello and pocket screws and brad nails and regular screws, be sure to check out that up here. And I guess we'll see you on the next one. Oh jeez. Hope that's not live. Oh. Oh.